friends uh, now we begin the next session uh, which is institutions and political processes and i request uh, my colleague uh, biju kumar to introduce the panel uh, chair and the speakers thank you uh, professor narendra kumar for giving an opportunity to introduce uh, some of my teachers and academic friends to this section and welcome to this section uh, section the session of the uh, session is titled as institutions and uh, political process and this session is chaired by professor ujjal kumar singh um, a professor of political science at delhi university and the distinct uh, speakers of this uh, session is uh, professor belvira arora is my teacher and uh, professor now vishnu bhagapatra is also my teacher he taught me in cps and, and then professor kam uh, kam khan uh, zwan taushing he is also my academic friend who is writing on northeast india which i have some kind of in it so let me introduce the uh, the uh, the chair of this session so professor ujjal kumar singh and he is a peer to you know uh, joining delhi university he taught political science uh, at punjab university chandigarh hindu college university of delhi and his areas of the specialization include human rights institutions and democratic governance constitutionalism state and extraordinary laws in india and his recent works say not titled drug his book was published um, which was co-authored with uh, professor anupama roy of cps the election commission of india uh, institutionalizing democratic uncertainty in city published uh, in 2019 published by oxford university press and his other books you know uh, the state democracy and the anti terror laws in india published in the year 2007 and political prisoners in india published by the of body university press let me come to let me you know introduce the professor belvir arora as i told you that he was my teacher in cps he taught me federal policy in india his mphil optional paper which i worked uh, of that it was an interesting now course on indian federal policy so sir belvir arora i taught uh, political science um, at the center for political studies um, 1973 to uh, 2010 then he was the rector of the university from uh, 2002 to 2005 and arora obtained his um, doctorate in, in political science from the university of paris and he was he has extensively you know writing on indian federal democracy multiple federalism and his sum of the ideas and written many you know uh, now works or uh, many articles and uh, books uh, but some of his uh, important uh, works i can say that indian federalism origin and development multiple identities in a single state diversity and uh, unity in the indian republic the value of cooperative federalism and his most uh, recent works is the multi elections and federal governance in comparative perspective co-authored with uh, kk kailash of the hyderabad central university but most uh, most recent his comments uh, especially i can find um, uh, in the in the um, uh, in the context of the covid how you now india uh, indian federalism uh, moved into a centralized the kind of federal federal setup and because of the you know, lockdown and uh, and, uh, and the impact of the lockdown on the people so he was also talking about i can see his comments on no uh, on uh, on these issues uh, especially during the uh, the lockdown period then i come to introduce uh, professor vishnu magapatra as i told you that you know uh, professor magapatra is also you know is a you know is a cps was a cps faculty and he taught me in fact i still remember his book review you know benedict anderson's imagined the community you know that was the book review i submitted to you know uh him and uh, and uh, for this my mphil course uh, and, and he was in fact he you know he's a you know, social theorist and and also a poet 
that is very distinct kind of uh, you know, identity he possesses. And um, Bhagavatra, in fact, um, taught politics for more than 25 years uh, at University of Delhi, Jawaharlal Nehru University, Asim Prem Ji University, and he has held uh, the visiting appointments in medicine and uh, sciences and Paris and National University of Singapore and University of uh, Kyoto, Japan, Japan and the National Institute of Advanced Studies, Bangalore. And from uh, 2002 to 2010, he headed the governance portfolio of the uh, Ford Foundation South Asia office, New Delhi. And he is the author for, you know, uh, for India, South Asia of the World Humanities Report supported by the UNESCO and the International Council for Philosophy and Human Sciences uh, and coordinated by the, uh, by the Council for you know, Humanities uh, Center and Institute University of its, uh, in medicine. And as I told you that uh, Professor Mogapatra is also a well-known Indian poet and he has authored five books on poetry and has translated two volumes of Pamela Nero's poetry into Odia and his latest volume of poetry in Odia, and which is called uh, I don't know, Barsha, uh, Barsha Badara, uh, is, a, is a meditation on a rain, on nature, was published uh, in July 2021. And let me introduce uh, Professor no, Kam Zwan, uh, Kam Kan, uh, Zwan Kaushin, and he is, in fact, is my academic friend. He is my you know, junior. You know, um, in CPS, and he is currently you know, heading the Department of Political Science, University of Hyderabad. And before joining Hyderabad Central University, he also taught uh, the Political Science at um, Department of Political Science, Banaras Hindu University. His areas of interest include asymmetric federalism in Northeast India, ethnicity autonomy, and the territorial management of ethnic conflicts in Northeast India. And not only an academic scholar, he, you know, he also you know, uh, is popular. He's a popular writer, especially his writing on the issues of Northeast in national and uh, regional newspapers, uh, newspapers. And he often appear in the you know, national and um, local TV channels uh, on any discussions on Northeast issues. And his uh, most important, as I told you that, his most important um, you know, uh, work is, uh, is on the asymmetric federal, uh, federalism. In fact, I was surprised when, when you know, I, have, I, I, was, you know, uh, I was in fact um, keenly watching you know, um, uh, so on, you know, when he was a student, he was writing so much. I can, I can, I can find Jansen in scholar writing so much article and published in the well-known no um, uh, article of uh, well-known journals um, you know, in the world. And uh, I can find that, that there's a rich kind, a rich, you know, richness of the data in his uh, you know, uh, publications. And uh, one of the recent articles which I come across is that the border conflict between Assam and Misora. And where I can find that, which was published both in the Hindu newspaper and in the Indian Express, where I can find that there's a rich uh, empirical data on Misoram and Assam on these issues. And um, um, with these words, um, you know, I now invite Professor Ujjal Kumar Singh for chairing this uh, section and conducting other business. Thank you. Thank you so much, Biju. Uh, and uh, thanks to uh, Professor Narendra Kumar and uh, faculty of CPS for giving me this huge opportunity. And uh, many congratulations to CPS. It's a session on institutions. And uh, what we're getting is, uh, you know, an institution which is vibrant, uh, and I must say, which is brave. CPS has been brave. Uh, that's what we've seen. And all those who are no longer teaching, uh, sometimes when you see their writings uh, in newspapers and blogs and things like this, uh, they have really taken up the challenge. And, and like, you know, uh, committed to institutions. So uh, uh, many congratulations and many best wishes to CPS. So we have three uh, uh, eminent uh, panelists over here. Uh, 
very well known. Uh, see, I have concerns when we talk of institutions. Uh, so there were so many sessions over here. This is last session and then there'll be validity free. Uh, and I'm talking about larger political science, not the CPAs. I think it's one area of political institutions uh, which, which uh, sort of neglected uh, dimension of political science, even though it's critical to political science, because if we have large number of studies, whether it's processes, movements in society and other, the building block comes to the institutions. Uh, so sometime back an article by Myron Wiener, 1976, India's new political institutions, post emergency uh, 1976, at the time uh, emergency period. And, and, and the first section start with centralized intelligence agencies. I don't think we have any research work on that. You have reflections, you have bureaucrats writing the experiences, but we don't have. And such institutions have become very, very important today. Uh, older textbook uh, and seniors over here would, you know, probably correct me if I'm wrong. The pre partition these textbooks used to have chapters on legislature, on executive, on judiciary, but also in police and army. Uh, those are part of political institutions in certain ways. We don't have too many studies. Uh, and these are absolutely important questions because uh, there is a concern around that institutions, uh, political institutions uh, are not performing to the best of the capacity. You may have occasions, you know, some judgment coming up, a certain legislation been rolled back or, you know, been brought in. There are new institutions which have come up. Uh, UID, uh, you know, our Aadhaar, uh, those didn't have actually, you know, origins in parliament, uh, executive order. So whole range of regulatory institutions, certain institutions. Uh, having said that, uh, uh, because CPS has achieved so much, it has given so much to political science. So uh, apart from past reflections, we need to also think of the future. And that's why such sessions, 50 years occasion is important because it gives a roadmap for the future of discipline. So with these words, I would invite Professor Balbir Arora uh, to start the session. It's 12.15, sir. Uh, every speaker gets 20 minutes. So at 12.30, I'll just, you know, tell you that five minutes more. So Professor Balbir Arora, it's to you, sir. Well, thank you very much, Ujwal. <clears throat> and, and thank you. Uh, Biju for your introduction. Thank you, Narendra, for the invitation. And let me say, I, I was listening to some of the um, in speakers and interventions yesterday, that it's been a wonderful walk down memory lane uh, for those of us who have uh, been part of this journey uh, for uh, a very long time. Uh, I think uh, my uh, stay in, uh, I'm probably am one of the few surviving members uh, uh, who uh, were there practically at the beginning. The first MA batch was passing out. And uh, it's, uh, I say, uh, an eventful journey. So I'll spend a little time uh, with your permission, Ujwal, to reflect on the journey itself because I owe it to the students and to um, the faculty uh, to place on record a few things uh, that I recollect from those times. And then I'll move to the more important question of uh, neglected institutions, which you perfectly set the stage. I couldn't agree with you more because my own career has been devoted to bringing institutions center stage. And that was the course I was teaching. Uh, now, why I want to go back a little bit is that uh, there were three uh, um, a sort of trinity uh, presiding deities of the CPS. Very different persons, Rashiduddin Khan from Hyderabad, Professor Seshadri, with the background of the Telangana Naxal, the not Naxal at that time, but the communist movement, 
and the uh, and Professor C. P. Bhambri, uh, who, like me, was from Multan, the other side of the border, and uh, he, this, these three persons, I was privileged to know, and count them among my friends, and I got along with them well. They were very different people, but what characterized the early years of CPS is the spirit of camaraderie and tolerance and acceptance of uh, honestly expressed differences of opinion. And I think that is the tradition that I would think we laid down at that time, is that the, the critical thinking and the spirit of inquiry, and of course, total freedom. The other aspect which I think contributed a lot to my own development is the fact that as the junior most uh, faculty, I was associated with all the tasks that uh, normally uh, young faculty uh, is assigned. I was in charge of the timetable, I was in charge of admissions, I was in charge. In the admissions process, small classes, 20, Interviews where we interviewed, sat for three, four days, interviewed each student for admission. And before um, the, um, the reservations of all kinds came up, we had a scale of 20 points on 100 for social, economic, and regional deprivation. And Reflecting back, for me, sitting through those interviews uh, year after year was an education because the applicants came from all over. I had spent the previous 10 years in France. And so it was, in a sense, a discovery of India. Student applicants who would come in crawling because they didn't dare stand in front of us. The satisfaction of seeing them walking out two years later with their head high was, I think, these are the intangibles and of satisfaction of having taught in CPS. I wanted to say this because uh, I was for 38 years in the CPS. And for the last 11 years, I've been um, um, at the Center for Multilevel Federalism in the Institute of Social Sciences. Uh, this richness, this tapestry, and this respect for each other, I think it still persists. It's a tradition, but this is the tradition that I would like uh, to celebrate in this 50th anniversary. That, uh, and I I will not have any advice for my colleagues um, uh, who are serving uh, these days because they have a far more difficult time than we did. I mean, to be very frank, we had much more freedom. And we, yesterday, Rajiv Bhargav talked about it, uh, the courses that we could introduce and the innovation that we could bring about, and none of the constraints of a heavy administration looking um, very suspiciously at what you're doing. We, we had autonomy, we had independence. That is CPS, as well as an institution, all the things that our political institutions need to have, and I'll be talking about that. But I think uh, uh, with your permission, uh, it's important to talk about values. I think values of inclusiveness uh, and uh, of being able to speak your mind, truth to power. And we know that we went through difficult times. The emergency came soon after. So we have been through that kind of thing also. Which is why I will not, as I said, give any advice to the 
current faculty because I have no right, because they are in situations which only they know how to handle. I will have some suggestions for students who are listening on what, how to carry forward this work, but that will come later. Now, the, the other thing that uh, may be worth recalling because um, I discovered that not many people realize this, uh, we were initially baptized as the center for the study of political development. Now, those of you who remember the textbooks of the 70s from the Princeton series of political development, and the, we, we, we were cast in that mold. And very soon, we decided that we didn't want to be cast in that mold and unanimously decided on the present uh, title of the uh, uh, Center for Political Studies. It was rejecting the political development framework, but it, at the same time, it was distancing ourselves from the first avatar of the CSDS and the first avatar of Rajni Kothari because uh, uh, he subsequently developed into a, a different kind of a political scientist, uh, much closer to what we were trying to be. Uh, as an alternative uh, way of looking at political science. So I think that also is important when we look, after, uh, look at our origins, that we set out to propose a different kind of political science, uh, different to the molds uh, of the time. I won't go deeper into that. I think I uh, would have made my point. Now, what we are facing, as I said, are challenging times. And I would like to focus on three major issues. The first issue is, if I might give it that label, the institution of opposition. How do we institutionalize opposition? There is some attempt, the leader of the opposition is recognized in parliament and so on. I, I would reflect on what opposition means today in the present context. Uh, of our development, of our political development. The second uh, theme that I would like to treat uh, is the institutional relays of popular sovereignty uh, translated into the exercise of political power. There are intermediate corps, there are in, uh, intermediate agencies and they are given various responsibilities uh, in order to produce what is conventionally called representative democracy. Uh, so again, we stay within the framework of institution. That's the title of the, of the uh, uh, session. And that's what I intend talking about. And the third theme that I would like to develop is the concept uh, which, uh, because the, the nation state is an institution, the nation state, the nation as a dilemma is something because it colors all institutions. I'll, I'll be clearer when I come to it. I just want to announce it as one of the things that I want to talk about. So first, the nature of opposition in federal systems. Let us be uh, fair. Uh, we are a federal system. I've written about uh, how we need to get out of this quasi-federal uh, trap that was uh, set for us uh, long ago, uh, and affirm proudly and emphatically that we are a federal nation. Because if you keep casting doubts on what you are, there are plenty of people to doubt what you are, people who will say that, you know, you know, what sort of federal system are you, this and that. I uh, believe that we are a federal system 
uh, with strong social base, but perhaps weak institutional articulation. So that's another uh, problem. Government and opposition in parliament uh, is the question of, uh, on the one hand, the decline of parliament. That's a perennial de debate. How do you measure the effectiveness of parliament? Recently, it was said, don't count the disruptions. Uh, count the number of bills passed. Yes, the bills are passed in half an hour. It is the quality of debate which makes uh, parliament. And unless you factor in the qualitative, the quantitative has no meaning. I mean, you, you don't count the number of hours, you don't count the number of sittings disrupted. Where is the debate? And that is what I would insist on. The quality of debate, not the numerical. Since we are a federal polity, the states as an arena of contestation and opposition. Opposition is not only in parliament. Opposition in a federal system is scattered across the polity. I would say that federalism is the last bastion of the opposition. If Opposition collapses in parliament. Where else do you have the opposition? You have it in the states, you have it in the regions, and therefore uh, it is, um, uh, as long as you have federalism and you have opposition somewhere in the polity, you have an opposition. If today there is a summit on democracy and um, um, President Biden is including India uh, in, among the uh, opposition, uh, the democracies which have not yet slid into autocracy. I would submit that it's in large part because democracy is thriving uh, in the uh, in the many of the states, uh, even if uh, it is under threat uh, at the center. And therefore, the uh, or in the uh, hinterland of majoritarian uh, majoritarianism. So that that is the second point that I wanted to. Uh, sir, what are five minutes more? Okay. Five minutes more. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so I'll, I'll I'll be brief because I had announced three things: the nature of the state beyond the state government distinction. Uh, I don't want to deal with that. In, and then, as I said, islands of democracy. Let me come straight to the second point of institutional erosion and democratic regression. There are three familiar targets. If you look at the movements which are taking democracy to uh, autocratic rule, whether you look at Trump, Trump, whether you look at Bolsonaro, whether you look at the political discourse of Zemmour, who is the uh, presidential candidate in France, there are three. Media conspiracy, which tries to, uh, so the media is one target. Media as an institution, you we see we are in that uh, um, frame of reference. The fact that elections are stolen, so there you come back to the election commission, that is it possible to steal elections? Um, Trump said his election had been stolen. Um, um, Bolsonaro says the same thing. We need to reflect on, on that. And the third is the anti-establishment which in India translates into anti-dynasty, the same discourse that you uh, repeat, that you are there to replace uh, a set of people who uh, were uh, uh, claimed to have a, a, a divine right to rule as it were. 
the authority and credibility of state institutions, I think Udwal knows this very well, and you hinted at it, the capture of all countervailing checks and the denigration of non-elective institutions. I think the, the, uh, this whole set I'm, I'm, I'm doing very um, big, uh, a very uh, a shorthand type of thing because I don't have uh, the time. Uh, and I would, um, and the last point on this, uh, draw your attention to uh, a term that was used by Maria Ressa, the, the Nobel Prize Peace Prize winner, uh, which talked about digital authoritarianism. Uh, what you talked about, uh, uh, UI, DAI, Aadhaar, and so on, I mean, these are shorthand, but uh, it, it is very much a part of the debate what we need to look at. The totalitarian state, which is armed with powers uh, of surveillance and the importance of giving legal substance to the right to privacy. This was something that was discussed in the previous session also, the, the cyber laws. Uh, but uh, uh, my approach, is different to the approach of political philosophers uh, because uh, that is a uh, it, it, it's a very practical issue for the survival of democracy. The final uh, point is the national security bogey. I think that is a major threat. The misuse of state power, which encroaches on the domain of the states. I set an alarm for myself also, but I'll continue. <laughs> uh, the, uh, for example, the um, extension of the um, BSF jurisdiction within states, the encroachment on the domain of states, the misuse of the FSPA, that is something that we need to look at but overall, the obsession with unity through uniformity, I think that is the problem. What is the nation we want? What is the nation? Is it based on tolerance, diversity, religious tolerance? Or is it this, this one-size-fits-all unity uh, with uniformity, which uh, is crushing political spaces that legitimately have every right to exist. The, the other point here, because then you have the one nation, one vote, would be a disaster uh, from all points of view. The simultaneous elections would violate federal principles as well as the basic structure. This is uh, something that we need to get, uh, keep in mind. So I'll conclude because I, I have three minutes more. Uh, no, actually it's over, but you, know, you have, you can have a minute or two, sure. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So the, uh, I draw, a, because this is what I had promised that I would do for the students. I'll flag three issues. Uh, the key issue is, is a stronger center the answer to our problems? Let us ask that question. A stronger center with weak states? There was a formulation earlier, Ramakrishna Hegde, strong center, strong states. But do we need a stronger center today than what it is? I think that question needs to be uh, asked and the, the strength of the center is in many areas that is for to be explored. For future research, uh, fiscal federalism, the, the um, GST council, water federalism, I would flag in the context of the global um, climate change and the mounting waters and the unseasonal rains and flooding and the dam bill that has just been passed 
uh, by parliament and green federalism in the uh, context of COP26 as to how are we going to achieve the goals that we have uh, laid down and promised unless we have uh, a vertical, uh, a horizontal federalism mechanism which would draw the states uh, in. And so I think I'll, I'll, I'll bring in the other points later. I, I want to stick, respect your authorities, sir. Ujwal, thank you. Not authority, you know, uh, comradeship, but thank you so much. And you also set the agenda for future research. Now we have uh, Professor Mishra Mahapatra. I've known him as a mentor and he's a very tough taskmaster. So, Professor Mahapatra. Uh, thank you, Ujwal. Thank you for your kind words. And Biju, I very fondly remember uh, you in my class, uh, Professor Balbir Arora, my esteemed uh, colleague at CPS. Uh, and and I'm really grateful uh, and, and thank uh, Narinda and the faculty of CPS for inviting me, which is an extraordinary historic occasion for all of us. And like all, this is also in some sense would contribute to us, as uh, Balvi said about reflection on an institution, because CPS is an institution. Uh, JNU is an institution. So this is, in some sense, a, a reflection on, on institution. And in that specific reflection, I would like to submit in the beginning that there is some reflection on our discipline. Uh, we are yet to create an archive for our discipline. Uh, we still haven't created a historical narrative of our own discipline in India. I may be wrong. We have some reports here and there. India is a huge country. Politics has been taught historically in different ways. Just to take one example, that although in the first report that uh, Professor Radhakrishnan produced on the higher education talks about political science, but you could see that political science emerged and acquired a kind of academic disciplinary status emerging from three disciplines or connected to three disciplines, let's say. One is law, another one is economics or political economy, and another one is history. So there is there's a whole archives that you have to produce. I hope that there'll be some work in this area because after all, there are many old faculty, old colleagues are, uh, you know, are, are present, some are already, uh, are gone. So I think it's important to create a both an oral and our other archives about history of our discipline. My own connection with CPS, I must say that look, I was almost coming to join CPS as a student in 1979. Uh, I was a student. I took admission in the University of Delhi in Hindu College. And certainly for some personal reasons, I, I remember coming to the interview. I was selected for MA CPS. And I remember Professor Kabiraj very distinctly uh, in the interview and, and, and stuff like that. And I didn't join CPS in, 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 in that year. I was, I remained in the University of Delhi uh, and, and, and so on. Second, I came after I completed my uh, master's in the University of Delhi, I came to uh, Center for Political Studies as a student of MPhil. And I remained, uh, that's the period of 1980s. And I had uh, Professor Balbir Arora, Professor Jaya Hassan, Professor Bambri, uh, Professor Sesadri, Professor Raji, you know, uh, all were my uh, teachers and Professor Jha were my, my, my teachers, uh, Professor Sunire. Ray. And, uh, and then I returned in 1990s uh, to teach at CPS. So there's kind of the three periods, two periods at least I can say 80s and 90s. And every discipline, as we could see, is an artifact. If sub sub discipline is also an artifact. When Ujjwal says that institution is a neglected area within the discipline of politics, it's actually nothing natural about it. There is something artificial about it. Uh, I remember that when we think about in this reflection, I think it was Edward Said who made a very clear, interesting distinction between thinking about discipline. One is filiation. Another is affiliation. 
we inherit academic disciplines. We are institutional, we do jobs, we come and do things, but we also affiliated to academic disciplines. It is in the process of affiliating with a discipline, we remake the discipline, we change the discipline, we bring the discipline into different trajectories and pathways. So this is, I think, is an exercise I'm very happy to uh, join with. The two things I want to say that why the study of institutions were really, when I came to University of Delhi as a master's student, when I was an undergraduate in politics, and when I came to do my MPhil, and then finally coming to 1990s, there is a, I'm just schematizing it, the two dominant ways in which institutions were looked at. One, what subsequently being called as old institutional analysis or old institutionalism was actually the institutions with which I was taught as an undergraduate. We looked at Indian constitution like that. We looked at various forms of government, whether presidential, parliamentary, different elements within a form of government. We looked at different institutional thing within the public administration, also within the Indian politics. And when it came to do comparative politics, we also came to know, come to look at some of these things yet again. But predominantly, which is also in many other places, this kind of way of looking at institutions was formal. It was predominantly juridical. It is to some extent structural, but it was, if I were to put it very strongly, it was actually deeply juridical in the sense that it, we knew everything about what a parliamentary form of government should be or what constitution actually provides us in letter. But we, that didn't focus a lot on the practices of it. And the stories were largely formalistic. So this way of doing institution is what I did. This is what I was taught. The books are largely focusing on this way of looking at institutions. What the institutions are all about? How were they caught up in this? How were they created? What are the, what are the laws which are sustaining them? And, and, and stuff like that. What are their functions? Uh, what, what do the functionaries do? And, and things like that. That's one. The other extreme that I experienced when I came to JNU uh, in 1980s, which was uh, at a time when um, it, it, it was a very ideological time when I was a student in 1980s, and Professor Balbira Arora suggested quite rightly that, you know, we oscillated because in the earlier kind of understanding institution, there's very little knowledge about what is actually happening how the institutions are actually connected to real domain of politics, to the social forces, to the political ideological constellations. There's very little understanding of that in the first set of understanding on institutions. When you came to JNU, Marxists had a very different way of looking at it. Let me look, look, let me just take this as an example, which meant that institutions are actually caught up in the politics of rule in a capitalist system where institutions are merely instruments, either for perpetuating, sustaining a rule, making certain relationship work, and, and so on and so forth. Even within the liberal interpretation, it was seen as extraordinarily important for maintaining a system which is seen, if you, if you are charitable, you would call it as fair, right? So much of the understanding of institution on the other side of the spectrum also became limited because of that. It, it throws a new light on how institutions really function. What are, the, what are the ways the class and communities, groups are connected to institutions? Why certain institutions become powerful? What do they do? What kind of things are obscure? What kind of these things that they're, they're normalized within the fabric of institution? What do they prevent? What would they facilitate? But these are, again, a structural story in which autonomy and focus on institutions got, got a bit blurred. If in the first mode of thinking about institution, we thought about the juridical aspect of it, in the second, it, became, it also became reductionist. It reduced everything to, to to the substratum of the class and community and things like that. I think 
in retrospect, I would like to say that Professor Arora and other people are actually trying to avoid these two extremes. Much of the, in 1990s, when I joined CPS as a faculty, study of institutions, happily for me, is actually emerging out of these two end of the spectrum, which were reductionist in their own senses. They highlighted something, they obscured a lot. Now, there's a rethinking on the idea of institutions, which took into account both its juridical legal elements, what they're supposed to do, and so on and so forth. Now, when I was doing my master's, we knew a lot about the processes. But if somebody asked us about what are the provisions of this and that, we didn't know. As somebody said, we are not taught the constitution the way its juridical elements were highlighted, let's say, textbook like D.D. Basu. Very juridical, as if constitution is all about its legal interpretation by the, by the court of India, whether it's high court or large Supreme Court. The point is, this kind of focusing on institutions are happening at a time when there are new questions are being posed, new context. Now, with, with the breakup of Soviet Union, a new intellectual context in which people have started reflecting on what institutions are all about. And this goes in the name of new institutionalism. New institutionalism actually is a large intellectual formation, very multidisciplinary intellectual formation, in which politics, disciplines of politics, economics, sociology, anthropology, all came, if not together, but they all contributed to it. Because everybody was finding, for different reasons, the value of institution. And asking this question that why institutions are either not there or not functioning, or what is the new regime of institutions emerging in different societies. In the 60s, the political development literature in, in, in political science, largely of American provenance, talked about in the context of the post-colonial societies as institutional decay, a problematic which is actually not fully and not fully reflecting what, what was happening in the sense the argument was that there is a huge overload on institutions in the newly independent countries. And because of this overload and the institution's lack of capacity to respond to them, there is an institutional atrophy or decay. Now, these questions were not the questions we wanted to ask in the beginning. We wanted to ask what is the relationship between institutions and society? We want to, some people ask big questions, like uh, my former late colleague, Satya Savarwal, because why modern institutions don't take root? Why institutions often find it difficult to enter into the popular imaginary? Why institutions still remain, not, not autonomy is not the issue, why they remain appear so distant, something as sometimes, for ordinary point of view, as a larger than life figure, and sometimes tyrannical. Why is that? In, in, in the literature in politics, we would find that institution is trying to help us understand the nature of democracy, nature of rule, right from local to state to national. It is also telling us, it is also giving rise to understand the puzzle of, of, of uh, Indian democracy, that why the, the institutional fabric, why, why institutions are not really, not, not sufficiently autonomous, neither sufficiently connected to people. Are we really requiring new institutions? Do we really do something with the old institutions? And, and things like that. And, and in, the, in, the, in the literature dealing with democracy, dealing with development, dealing with comparative understanding of institutions. Let's say institutions are introduced at the same time in Kerala, in Punjab, in Orissa, in, 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 in Uttar Pradesh, but why do they perform so differently? Professor Mahapatra, yeah. another four minutes. Yeah, yeah sure. So, so these are the kind of questions. So there, there came a time in, in 1990s onwards that the three thinking on institutions have come up in a very different way. It is no more 
tethered to the old ways of thinking. But if one were to say, one could say that they actually produced in a newer kind of synthesis, I would say, is a better way of thinking about institution. Less reductionist, more political, critical, without compromising with its form, formal characteristics, its legal foundations, where they're located, how they come into being, and, 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 and such like. Finally, I want to say three important challenges for us. One is we know it's very familiar for a very long time. It's a long story. It's, it's a familiar story of institutional capture. Institutions are created. Institutions are, institutions are embedded in society. How much embedded is the question? But once they're embedded, they're, they're located in society, institutions are always prone to be captured. And we know we have a lot of histories about how institutions are truly captured. If institutions are simply defi defined by, as Douglas North defines it as a kind of rule of the game, then you can see rules are always either, the institutions are captured because the rules are Rules are can be can be modified, can be uh, interpreted, can be uh, and so on and so forth. So one is the institutional capture. That's a story that we hear every day. That you you keep institutions, but you make the institution perform according to the necessity of your political rule and 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 things like that. Second, I think, is the question of. Uh, countervailing capacity of institutions. Institutions that are supposed to create a countervailing power within the political system. There is an argument that that actually is fairly on the win. There are many other institutions acquiring greater power over citizens. But the institution specifically supposed to hold the power to account. The weakness of institutions are quite evident there. For example, there is a body of literature that suggests that in the period of neoliberal economic development, the legislature, for example, has declined in comparison to executive, in comparison to other, uh, other elements in, 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 in government. So that, again, the countervailing capacity. Third, the connect or disconnect between ordinary citizens and institutions. That still remain an important element particularly at a time of digital, the rise of digital, you can say, digital mode in which state wants to control, the state wants to connect. How much of it is changing the relationship between citizens and institutions? And this is where I think a lot of work, some work has been done. People are constantly, because this is a dynamic, fluid field, there is no reality which is out there that you can go and see and, and say this is how it is. So, so I think these, I think, three important challenges before us. I agree with Professor Balbir Arora about the challenges he set out, but I, I would add these three to it, that these are the challenges of our time. And as a student of politics, we have to make sense of how, how to approach these questions. And thank you very much. Thank you, really. Thank you so much, Professor Mahapatra. And you know, especially the roadmap for future research in terms of challenges which you have presented to us would be very, very useful. And now, uh, Professor Swang, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, so please go ahead. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Ujwal, for this time. and. My warmest greetings and congratulations to the CPS uh, fraternity, the past and the present, uh, on the Golden uh, Zubili celebration for having undertaken to be added such a wonderful and meaningful academic journey and the many milestones that we have achieved together. I would like to thank Professor Narendra Kumar and the faculty of CPS for your thoughtfulness heartwarming gesture and signal owners who stand in the shoulders of CPS Zions, including my mentor, Professor Arura, and my teacher, uh, Professor Bisnu Mahapatra, who happened to also teach me a course uh, during my MA, to share my experience and learning from CPS and the way this helped me in 
my subsequent academic endeavors to contribute in a very limited way to understanding institutions and political process. There is a saying that the strength of a chain depends on the strength of its weakest link. I am aware that I constitute one of those weak links at the outset, but I also am aware that I am someone who has been groomed in ways to recognize and gradually overcome my inherent limitations through the equality of circumstances that GPS or GNU offers so that I may be able to lend to the vitality and strength to, of the values, the ethos and principles of these hallowed institutions. Uh, as someone who study and teach institution and political process for over two decades, I take the designs, structures, essence, constituted by the agenda, interests, and strategies of these agents or actors and interactions within institutions very seriously. The first thing that struck me when I got admitted into ZNU in the late 1990s is its ideational and structural designs, very well encapsulated in the ZNU logo and in the architectural designs of academic buildings and hostels. Sooner do I realize that I'm engaged with an idea and structure that cascaded autonomy, which in a sense is a replication of the ideational and architectural designs that are found in abundance in GNU premise are so important in ways to reflect upon and uh, critically engage on the various aspects and dimensions of issues and debate and notice in the NB and, and beyond. The interface or interaction that ZNU allows within this ecology of interactive engagement, drawn as we are from different corners of the country with diverse backgrounds and experience, open up new vista of understanding, you know, the kind of which is very well encapsulated in the DIA of the ZNU logos, which in effect also promote in a way exchange of ideas and discursive communication, which I think are amenable to unculcate self-reflexivity, uh, self create, creative and critical academic engagement in ways which strengthen and broaden our academic horizons. And these, I think, are very critical for students as well as researchers working on various dimensions of institution and political process to locate a research problematic within a larger canvas of theory and concepts which are used elsewhere. I think one of the ways in which I learned and built upon my understanding of institution and political institutions had been facilitated largely by the course designs and institutional pathways that CPS and for that matter ZENU offers to me. The choice-based credit system, for example, which is a very creative and which was considered to be very revolutionary in the way in which we structure our course curriculum and pedagogical structure in ZNU is in effect something which is now being let on upon by the current re regime with its emphasis on new education policy, which also allows us to shift our economic orientation and interest from one center to another center, which in a way also helped us, you know, broaden our intellectual canvas in ways which inculcate the spirit of self-reflexivity self that I, in effect, outlined before. And the MA field trip, which is a component of the MA course curricula in ZNM, in fact, open ups for the first time for me and for many cohorts in the Center for Political Science or in the Political Studies to undertake real-time field studies, which in a way also train us to sharpen the methodological as well as theoretical tools that we are equipped and trained in the Center for Political Studies. And the library system, of course, is another institutional pathway which in effect enable us to easily crisscross you know, the capacious uh, or resourceful uh, study materials are available not only in ZNU libraries, but in Teen Murti, but in IBSA or in Indo Sastri, American Center, Max Muller, and National Archives of India. And because of this interactive 
engagement and the ability to seamlessly traverse across you know these resource uh, uh, centers enable us to think about certain key concepts theories or particular frameworks which in effect use are very useful in reflecting upon and thinking through the research problematic that we work with. So I started my research and teaching uh, under three broad contexts, which I think have very important bearings on my experience, on my learning, as well as academic engagement at the Center for Political Studies and beyond. And this is, I think, very important for me because I must be one of the few exceptions who in effect straddle both research and concurrently doing uh, uh, undertaking teaching at Banaras Hindu University. So one of the important uh, broad context in which I engage seriously into research and also in teaching political institution and political process, in effect, is the durable disorder back home in Manipur from where I come from. In 1997, just a year before I joined CPS as a student of MA, we had a bloody ethnic conflict which broke out, which in effect was responsible to raising to the ground my home state and the, the petty fields which was ripe for cultivation. And in fact, this troubled some experience and in effect linger in my mind so much so that in due course of time, when I seriously engage with issues of conflict, with issues of autonomy, with issues of identities, the kind of existential experience that I encounter at home, in effect, helped me sharpen on capturing the nuance and complex dimension of ethnic conflicts and civil war in Northeast India. The second important background context, which in effect also play a very important part in shaping my ideational or foundational premise around my academic orientation and engagement in the future are a set of institutional transformation, which in effect continue to have overarching influence on the way I think and engage with issues of identities, autonomy, patriotism, and for that matter, the issue of politics of accommodation in Northeast India. One is the structural adjustment program and the contingent liberalization, privatization, and global integration of Indian economy. And in, in effect, this is also the time which coincide with the unleashing of capital, which in effect led to a scarring of competition among Indian states, which, uh, you know, uh, Rob Jenkins would call it as uh, a Darwinist, provincial Darwinism. This is also the time in which you have various social movements centered around Mazit, Mandal, and Kamandal in ways which restructure the ideas, the discourse, and some of the important contestation that are pertinent when we reflect upon the institutions and the political process that entail along this broader context. The second uh, broader context, which in effect got underway under this broad institutional transformation, which I think also has important bearings on the kind of academic engagement I'm engaged with is the consolidation of what Professor Arora and others call bipolar coalitions at the national level and the federalization of India's party system. And this is also the time in which you have the emergence of states or regions as important arena of Indian politics. And to locate, to be able to locate the kind of problematics that emerge in Northeast India within this broad converse, I, canvas, I think is very important for me to look at how theories and concepts or you know certain research problematic which in effect are resonating very well at the national level have their local resonance in northeast india and the third broad context in which uh, i i think uh, uh, my work has important uh, in depthness is the incremental ideational and institutional change in northeast india in terms of restructuring of the politics of autonomy and the politics of accommodation. And I have in mind, for example, the uh, Northeast Industrial Policy, which was uh, crafted in 1997, the SP Sugla Commission of 1997, uh, uh, which in effect tried to open up 
Northeast India as attractive destination of infrastructural development, and which it also recalibrate policy orientation of the center vis-a-vis -vis Northeast India in ways which augment autonomy and the terms of federal state relations in Northeast India. And this is also the time in which donor as a separate department of Northeastern region was created in 1998, which was subsequently upgraded to the Ministry of Development of Northeastern region in 2004. And as some of you who are interested and looking closely at institutional development in Northeast India knows this would also entail a particular recalibrating of fiscal relationship between the center and the periphery. And given that Northeast India has uh, a special constitutional status called the special category state status with preferential funding, the kind of uh, non lapsable central pool of resources which was earmarked by every ministry at the center, 10% uh, of which were earmarked for infrastructure development entails a new level of engagement or relationship between the center and the states in Northeast India. And with the change in around 2004-05 on the funding pattern, whereby the states are uh, asked or encouraged to mobilize 30% out of this infrastructural development in Northeast India, we also have possible fault lines of blowbacks or renegotiation between the center and the states. And this is also the time in which you have the expansion of the Northeastern Council in 2004 and the constitution of the BPC Even Ready Committee, which in effect passed very important, uh, uh, come up with very important report on the AFSPA and the way it implicate on thinking through extraordinary laws and its implications on human rights in Northeast India. I think uh, over and above these two, uh, two broad uh, context, I think my work and my engagement in the domain of institution political process was also informed largely by the broad context of the end of two major insurgency in Northeast India, the Mizo and the Bodo insurgency, and the politics of peace accords, which in effect proliferate in ways that redefined or configure and reconfigure inter as well as intra ethnic relations in Northeast India. And the politics of ceasefire, which is often seen as politics by other means between the NSC and, and the government of India in 1997, which was extended in 2001, also have important background contextual bearings on the way I engage with different ideas or issues, you know, centered around institution and political process in Northeast India. And this is precisely where I think uh, I, uh, uh, you know, uh, towards the end of my presentation, this is the last leg of my presentation, I'll flag three or both, four broad areas of my academic engagement and limited uh, contribution. And given this broad context, you know, the overarching uh, context in which uh, I situate my academic engagement and my teaching contribution, uh, I, the enduring saliency of identities and the politics of territoriality continue to be very engaging, deeply contentious and problematic in Northeast India. And, uh, and one of the ways in which I engage with these issues of uh, complex identity politics and the politics of territoriality is the way in which the uh, instrumentality of settled tribe recognition regime entails the narcissism of minor differences within and across tribal communities in Northeast India. And the more you have this narcissism of minor differences, the likelihood of ethnic fault lines or conflict erupting at any given point of time, which in fact implicate on institutions and the kind of autonomy mobilizations in this place. And I think the politics of territoriality, which also entwined with the politics of identities, continue to be a very pertinent theme, which I'm continually engaged with. And given that you have a long intellectual pedigree of looking at how institutions uh, or, or, or social diversities are embedded in institutions, the kind of work that William Livingstone did in the 1950s, Be and the like work that, 
uh, yeah, uh, yeah, you're sure. Uh, the like of work that, uh, you know, in India, Professor Rasituddin Khan, Ziyad Paul Soudhury, and Professor Balvira Rai and others have taken up, in effect, illuminates on our Have we lost uh, Professor Suan? I, I think I'm unable to hear his voice. You're um, right. We lost you're right. Yes, not able to hear him. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's frozen. Narinder, if you have his phone number, why don't you just call him and tell him that this. You may not yeah, I will do it. I will do it. I think we should go ahead because Professor Swan was virtually closing his, uh, you know, argument. And what, what we heard from him was uh, primarily he located himself and his understanding and of institutions and placed himself and his entire gamut of work uh, in terms of uh, the, the developments taking place in Northeast and what CPS contributed. and then, uh, and the new areas which he was looking at, politics of spirituality and others. Uh, so uh, uh, I think I, I must thank all three speakers and open up uh, 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 the the forum for uh, questions. Uh, I'll, I'll I have, you know, we uh, should have an anxiety, you know, before uh, I joined this session, uh, you know, I misplaced my specs. And immediately uh, I thought, you know, how will I join this session? But, you know, somewhere I believe what's happening now is, is you know, 50 years training of CPS, development of political science. Uh, probably we have not been able to really uh, foresee the challenges which are happening now. Uh, our discipline uh, has helped in many ways, but especially when it comes to institutions, political institutions. It's like, you know, do we need another spec? Probably not. But do we need to do our political science, especially our study of institutions in, in a newer way, uh, so that, you know, we don't end up lamenting. We need to be a, a vibrant community who, who have answers, uh, so not that we have to change, uh, we, we need to change our way of looking at institutions. What are those things which we have missed uh, so that you know, our explanatory framework uh, remains weak? Uh, I believe our explanatory framework are not as robust as it, they, would, they should be. So these are my concerns, but you know, speakers may have this later, but you know, please do take up questions from other, other colleagues first, and then if you have time, then you can reflect. Uh, Sorry, so my internet got snapped in between, so it's fine. Yeah, I have made my point, so yeah. Yeah, thank you. So I just had some some concern which I raised, but you know, let others come in. And, and Narendra ji, uh, uh, how do we go about, do people, are they going to write in the chat box the questions so that everyone can see, or would they raise their hand? Unmute, unmute, Narendra. Uh, in fact, uh, we can go with uh, raising of the hands, and uh, we see that there are two uh, raised hands, Aftab Alam and Jongi. 
Okay, so uh, what uh, after and John Gwitty will go on, you know, and then you, you have two more hands. But be very brief, you know, because session is 1.30 and we need a lot of questions and you know, we need questions so that speakers will respond. So please come straight to the question. After, would you please start? Okay. Uh, very warm regards to my teachers, Professor Balveer Arora and Professor Vishnu Mahabhatra. Balveer Arora sir has taught us uh, Indian politics structure and process. So it's a very brief question to sir, Professor Balveer Arora, that to what extent the conceptions of originalism and living constitutionalism and transformationalism to understand the Indian constitution or to capture the essence and nature of Indian constitution is valid uh, or are there any alternative ways to uh, look at the uh, constitution? Because we are talking about the institutions, but institutions originate and take shape in the context of the text that is the Indian constitution. Thank you. Great. So John Gwitty. Can you all hear me? Am I audible? Yes, yeah, very much. All right. Hi, uh, my name is John Thangal Sanguite. I'm a research scholar with the Center for International Politics and Disarmament, CPOT, in SIS. Uh, as you already know, international relations is a branch of political science. So uh, my question to, I mean, the entire panel is not specifically to Professor Kamgan Swan, is that uh, the, I was working with the National Human Rights Commission. So my thesis deals with human security. So uh, uh, Bertrand Rancheran's book, Human Rights and Human Security. It's a groundbreaking work related to human rights and how human security is an uh, indivisible component of human rights. Right. So both of them being related. So how much of thought and focus does CPS as a center and even as a different political thought uh, encompass the issue of human security and human rights? As you already know, there's a lot of human rights violation in India taking place right now. The issue of Nagaland, the issue of Nagaland right now just recently. So IR in political science is indivisible. So human security and human rights and national security itself is uh, one component. I see it as one family. So how much does CPS have that, that particular thought? So that's my question to all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, are there other hands up? I don't see any other hand. Uh, Vikas, there is that your hand up? Ujjal, there are other hands. Yeah. Amir and uh, Vikas Tripathi. There are two more hands. I okay. Think. So Vikas and then Amir. Oh. Thank you, uh, thank you so much. And uh, it's really been like attending uh, anime classes once again. Uh, really grateful to all the speakers for uh, presenting so well. <coughs> uh, and it's, uh, uh, I just uh, wanted to speak on locating institutions. Like uh, yesterday, also Professor Sudha Pai uh, made this concern that. The institutions, study of institutions has been at margins, and today Professor Mahapatra offered some explanations as to why institutions remained at the margins. And it is only in the context of 1990s that there was a rekindling of interest in the study of institutions. But do you really see uh, the present moment being very self limiting in? study of institutions and I'll, uh, uh, I'll i'll give one context to it which is that the we are always very uh, uh, what the correct term would be very skeptical we are always in doubt to raise the question about decay of institutions and decline of institutions and we are always uh, you know whenever uh, even uh, I have read so many books on Parliament Election Commission, and we do not ever go in detail in dealing uh, with the decline of institutions. Like Professor Arora, like in context of Parliament, we have three major positions. Like Professor Arora and Professor Rodericks, they consider that in-house business has declined, but this has been a moment of uh, great transformation. This is a moment of federalization. So. We need to take into that because we have to be so, short. So my my, my uh, just, uh, to cut the point short, uh, one reason why we have not been able to deal with the institutions centrally with uh, is that we fail to deal with this idea of decline or decay. We have never made an attempt 
to really define what constitutes the decay or decline of institutions and its Indian context. There's, there, there, there are no study. Uh, Ujwal sir, please give me one minute. Uh, See, Vikas, I'm okay, okay, very okay, keen uh, to hear, you okay, know, okay. Okay. speakers. Okay. I have to learn so much. So thank you so much. Okay. Uh, and this will, this will have to continue. You have your teachers, you'll have your email. Thank you, so sir. let's move to Amir Ali. Okay. Thank you. Um, this is a question from Professor Arora. Uh, it's a, a quick observation and a, a question based on that. So, Professor Arora, you, I thought you very graciously refrained from giving any advice to current and serving members of the faculty. But the one message that I took from your, I must say, riveting presentation was that we must understand the magnitude of this moment, that this is really big. Um, and you know, this is not, I mean, if there's only, if there's one signpost, it's 1930s, uh, you know, almost 100 years ago. Now, based on that observation, um, let me ask you a question, and this is also you know, for, for a wider reflection. Given the fact that there is absolutely no institutional forbearance amongst regimes and dispensations across the world, I mean, there's no respect for institutions, which I interpret as institu institutional forbearance. What hope for institutions? I mean, they are bound to be crushed by the sheer magnitude of the political weight and stress that is going to be put on them. Uh, Bhupendra, do you have a question? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, thank you, all of the speakers. Like all, uh, as all, all have reflected upon the history, context, and the prospects of the institution in general, and CPS in particular, and the role it plays. I was curious to know about the politics of the study of political studies itself. So the context, the political context, the the political studies center for political studies, it has been invasion and the kind of challenges ahead, which. It is, it, is, it is being felt that the Center for Political Studies is not, in a, in a sense, uh, like able to uh, deal with the challenges of the political situations it has uh, uh, in contemporary times. Uh, so how to like relate it with the history of its invasion and the uh, contemporary uh, challenges we have now. So uh, any one of you can please. Uh, uh, Thank you, Bhutan. Uh, Thank you. Thank invasion you. is a very strong term, but thank you so much. Uh, we don't have much time left, so I would rather like, uh, you know, John Guite, you asked, you know, let, let, uh, let the speakers respond because we are very keen to uh, uh, you know, seek their response too. So uh, anyone who wants to go ahead. Uh, Arora, why didn't you go first? Okay, thank you, uh, <clears throat> Vishnu. Yes, uh, because uh, many of the questions are addressed to both of us. Now, uh, let me take uh, Aftab's uh, question first. Uh, the, the, the notion of living constitution is still valuable because a constitution, apart from the fact that it, it has its own organic growth and subject to uh, uh, the limitations, for example, in our case of basic structure. I do believe that the constitution requires periodic re-allegiance of the citizens. That, uh, that allegiance to the constitution needs to be renewed, that they stand by the preamble, that they stand by the basic principles. And uh, that is something that uh, is part of the uh, process of uh, constitutional development. So I, I would stick with the concept of living constitution. It has many uses. The second question um, uh, which Vikas put uh, is the question of how do you measure decay and decline of institutions? It is a valid question because uh, if you look at uh, writings of the early uh, 20th century or the um, middle of the uh, 19th century, or particularly the pre-war years, you will find many laments. We were not part of the game. We were a colony of other democracies and the lament that the democracies were declining. So it is not a new problem. What, uh, when I talk of regression, I, 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 there's decline, uh, dec uh, decline and decay. Huntington introduced it. Is, uh, 
uh, yeah, but it's uh, it's problematic. I talk of backsliding. I talk of regression. Is that the values and the standards to which you had risen? If you are sliding back, then there is a measurement there that you are uh, uh, moving away from the uh, progress that you had made. So I think for whatever it's worth, uh, there is, it is a comparative thing. And here I would make a plea, is that the study of Indian political institutions has to get rid of Indian exceptionalism. We need to situate ourselves within a comparative framework. Federalism has done that. You know, we are part of the International Association of Centers for Federal Studies. There is a flourishing a branch of comparative federalism. Uh, populism, I think comparative populism is a very interesting area of study because there are more and more regimes which uh, have this uh, characteristic. Let us try to situate the Indian experience and the Indian uh, uh, way of uh, dealing with political institutions it's, uh, in, in a comparative perspective. And we'll find that there are many elements that we can learn from others. Amir Ali uh, has put a, a, a very strong uh, question on the uh, magnitude of the moment and the uh, the uh, how how do we respond to it and um, the, i think i mean there the, there are huge issues uh, where the basic uh, principles um, of um, to use a, a word that is often uh, derided of secularism and religious tolerance are uh, uh, being questioned. And that is what makes me say that this is the, the problem that we are facing, uh, which is rooted in some of the things that I said about the, the uh, unity uh, with uniformity and the question of uh, the uh, what uh, Ujwal talked about. Uh, I think uh, we need to reflect on that. The magnitude of the moment should not paralyze us. And that brings us to uh, Bhupendra Kumar's thing that the CPS has not been unsuccessful in dealing with challenges. The CPS has a, a stellar record of grappling with the problems of its time. The, the, the most important task for uh, scholars is to first understand and then grapple with contemporary problems. And if, uh, if I don't find the CPS shying away from uh, grappling with the, the problems of our times, whether it is allowed to express itself freely, whether uh, it has uh, the, the uh, I don't doubt the capacity, but I doubt sometimes uh, the uh, space that is required to answer some of the uh, pressing problems of the time. That's, that's what I would say. Thank you. Prasmal Patra? Yeah, yeah no, I, I, uh, there are a lot of very interesting questions. Uh, I think the uh, Ujwal's point in the beginning that, you know, that what should we do to, to, to see that we take institutions seriously, but also study them in a way that, that, that would answer some of the questions that we are discussing here. Um, my own, own sense is that, you know, there is, there has to be a combination between our empirical uh, understanding of institutions with a focus on on both here and now and also history along with values you know you see in the institutionalism literature people make a lot of distinction between historical institutionalism normative institutionalism you know let's say they, let's even take uh, these two 
you would find the values are as important as the processes because they're all intimately connected. And every functioning of the institution, the, the how and why questions, that what, how the institution is functioning and why, I think these are very important questions at a given point in time. But sometimes to understand it, we may need, you know, to, to look at the, the, how the institution is actually connected to society. What kind of values it brings in, how people perceive institutions and, and things like that. So we need institutionalism is like many other questions, many other problems that we deal with are essentially to be handled from multiple uh, vantage points and also, also with multiple intellectual and methodological resources. That would be my submission. So the more we do it in a, in a kind of way, I think we might find a better way of really understanding some of these big questions. About the, the, the question about the human rights and security, uh, these are ongoing things. And, 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 and this is where, you know, the institutional, for example, people, there are, there are quite a few studies on the National Human Rights Commission of India. And you have to really see in the institutional evaluation, evaluating an institution, how do you, for example, we, uh, me and my former colleague Neraja would once did a kind of this thing, but we, we thought that there's an internalist and an externalist account of an institution. An internalist institution account is a, is a limiting account. It's a limited, useful, but limited account where you, you only look at institutions precisely uh, by paying attention to the promises or, or, or the, what really holds that institution internally. But there are also the external dimensions to institutions. You know, how, what, how the institution is perceived. There is, for example, in the survey, in the national sample survey that you get, and also the CSDA survey, you'll get always a battery of questions, trust questions, as you call it. How the institutions are trusted in India. And you'll find some institutions are trusted more than others. So this is a kind of ongoing question that not only the Center for Political Studies, but the larger society interested in. And it is the job of the student of politics is to figure it out how to make this evaluation functioning of institution understand that much better. Because these are all complex questions. How do the institutions really function and so on? I hope I'm answering your question. And the third question about decline, as, as, as well, we said, the decline itself is, is sometimes defined very differently, perceived very differently. It's just like a landlord in the village says that do, the, the people in the villages have lost their um, uh, how to behave because they're now replying back. You know, there is a decline in village, you know, kind of morality, if I would put it. But that cannot be a decline from the point of view of the people who are challenging the authority in the in the village society and stuff like that. So institutional decline, where, how, I think we have to have a bit of granular understanding apart from our theoretical understanding of where the decline is and why and how and when. These questions are very important for institutional analysis. And about, of course, Amir's question was directed to Balbir, but the institutions are, or the, or the, the, the kind of fabric of how can call it through which you build your uh, collective life. Uh, democracy uh, requires institutions, but democracy also requires a few other things. For example, uh, Ambedkar's last final rumination, it talks about constitution also for better functioning requires a better society. It requires better inculcation of values. It requires a better sense of connection what the Ambedkar's greater emphasis on fraternity. Or at some places, Ambedkar would say, you will get the institution depending on what kind of people are manning or managing your institutions. So often in the institutional literature, some of these things are not presented like that. But you could see that institutions are also kind of important because they are, they, they, they are like the, the, the elements to which you, you govern and governed or ask uh, questions and, and things like that. So that is why, despite the fact that institutions are captured time and time again, and institutions don't deliver, institutions feel deeply alienating. Institutions feel, uh, you know, kind of overly um, 
kind of anti people. Uh, and then most we are the past the time an yeah. important challenge. And finally, I think the politics of knowledge that Bhupendra raised is an important question. My own personal view, uh, with I can only say that because I'm also an academic, the knowledge about politics is not fully concentrated in academic institutions. Knowledge of politics is also distributed beyond academic institutions. Politics is everybody's affair. Uh, if politics is only affair of the political scientists, then that will be too bad for society. So, so it is too important subject to be entirely monopolized by 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 political scientists. So the fact of the matter there, but it's an important question about the politics of knowledge as to how and, and what we study and why. And one of the reasons why CPS and JNU was I from based on my experience as both a student and then faculty is that not merely we ask this question that in terms of what you study, but how we study. Greater degree of reflexivity, greater degree of looking at our knowledge sometimes with a with lot of questions and doubts. That in fact makes us makes this kind of thing interesting rather than so, so Mahapatra will have Yeah, I'll move. stop here. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Professor Swan, uh, you you also presented your self reflections were very helpful in understanding, you know, study of institutions. Your final word. Yeah, thank you. I, I just want to reflect on uh, the institutional decline and how, you know, majoritarianism at the local level might, in effect, uh, tell us about the larger, you know, frame of. Uh, making sense of how this uh, local majoritarianism spill over to larger regional as well as federal uh, level. I think uh, one of the things that we as uh, academics need to do is to engage more actively, but in all in in our uh, public engagement to dispel some of the misconception about jurisdictional confines of institutions. I think because there is so much of misgivings as well as misconceptions about graded autonomy structure in Northeast India and for that matter other parts of India, there is a palpable sense of insecurity in the minds of these majoritarians that, you know, giving autonomy to local communities in effect, uh, you know, have larger implication on the national unity or national integrity. I think uh, uh, because these cascaded autonomy linkages are well defined, the jurisdiction of which are delimited in the constitutional provisions, I think so long as these constitutionally delimited functions and powers are devolved and actualized by local communities, I think there should not be any reason why majoritarian groups need to be so insecure or uh, feeling unease and discomfort with the idea of cascaded autonomy. I think this is something that has not been effectively addressed in the public uh, in discourse. And I think we have a responsibility, not only as teachers, but also as researcher working on these domains, how we might you know, manage or accommodate territorially mobilized identity groups around and across uh, geographical space in India. Thank you so much. We are well beyond time, and I'm you know, really grateful to all three speakers, eminent speakers, and very pointed questions. I'll just you know stop by repeating what Professor Aroda said: that magnitude of the moment should not paralyze us. Actually, we need to be optimistic in terms of actually thinking newer ways of addressing the concerns, because the CPS, which has been at the forefront of academic excellence, and also very brave set of uh, you know. Uh, set of academicians over here. We need to, you know, these are the moments where we need to rethink our methods, address the concerns, fine, and, and, and work on institutions in a way so that we can make sense to the students who are coming up, because ultimately we owe it to our students. So how to, you know, explain the moment to them, how to see that institutions work in certain, so certain normativity would come in. So, Let's rework our understanding and strengthen uh, the discipline as well. Thank you so much. Uh, may I request uh, Jyoti Rupa, uh, our student, to present formal vote of thanks to the chair and the panelists, please? Uh, thank you, sir. 
Uh, on behalf of CPS, I would like to thank Dr. Biju Kumar for introducing this session, the chair, Professor Ujjal Kumar Singh, and the speakers, Professor Balveer Arora, Professor Bishnu Mohapatra, and Professor Kamkan Swan for your valuable time and insights. Uh, we, we will now break for lunch. Post that, we will have a valedictory session in which we will also have a presentation of the key takeaways from this two seminar, from this two days of the event by the chairperson, Dr. Narendra Kumar. So we uh, hope to see you at 2.30. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, all so of I will take a moment to thank the report writer, Mariam. Uh, I'm sorry <laughs> yes. I missed out of that, which is not cool. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.